you know that any system with minimum energy is very stable. Hence, a system tries to attain stability by lowering its energy. The atoms of the elements in the 18th group, that is, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon possesses minimum energy and hence are highly stable among all the elements in the periodic table. As a consequence, they do not take part in any reaction and hence they are aptly called noble gases or inert gases. On the other hand, the atoms of other elements are less stable. As a consequence, they show a tendency to combine with other atoms of the same or different elements to form compounds to attain stability. Let us now understand how the stability of inert gases, in contrast to other elements, can be explained in terms of electronic configuration. Here, in the first table, you can see the atomic numbers and electronic configurations of noble gases. The second table shows the atomic numbers and electronic configurations of some other elements, along with some compounds formed by these elements. As you can see in the first table, all the elements, except for helium, have eight electrons in their outermost shells. Helium has two electrons in its first shell. Examine its structure shown here. You know that the first shell can accommodate only two electrons. Hence, helium which has the smallest atom among all the inert gases, is stable with a two-electron arrangement. The presence of two electrons in the first shell, called a duplate configuration, or eight electrons in the valence shell, called an octet configuration, is collectively referred to as inert gas configuration which is the most stable electronic configuration. From this, we can infer that atoms that do not have a duplate or octet configuration try to achieve it by losing, gaining or sharing electrons. The atoms of different elements may lose or gain different number of electrons depending on their electronic arrangement. When an atom loses or gains electrons, it attains a charge. An atom with a charge is called an ion. Let's now understand how both sodium and chlorine attain stability. Let us consider the formation of sodium chloride. The atomic number of sodium is 11. It has an electronic configuration of 2, 8, 1. On the screen, you can see Bohr's atomic model of sodium. Sodium has 11 protons, 11 electrons and 12 neutrons. As you can see, two electrons are accommodated in the first shell, 8 in the second and one electron in the valence shell. Sodium loses one electron and forms a sodium ion and attains the nearest inert gas configuration of neon. The sodium ion has one proton more than the number of electrons and hence the ion formed is left with one positive charge. Now Let's look at chlorine. 
Chlorine has the atomic number 17. It has 17 protons, 17 electrons and 18 neutrons. As you can see from Bohr's atomic model of chlorine, it has 2 electrons in the first shell, 8 in the second and 7 in the valence shell. If it gets one more electron, it attains the electronic configuration of the nearest inert gas, argon. Chlorine gains an electron to form a chloride ion. The chloride ion so formed has one electron more than the number of protons. And hence, is left with one negative charge. From the table, you can compare the number of electrons and protons available for each atom, before and after attaining stability. Thus, in the formation of sodium chloride, sodium loses one electron to form a sodium ion, and attains the nearest inert gas configuration of neon. On the other hand, chlorine gains one electron to form a chloride ion and attains the nearest inert configuration of argon. The electrostatic forces of attraction between these oppositely charged ions result in the formation of sodium chloride. Now let's see how atoms attain stability by sharing electrons and form molecules. Let's consider the formation of chlorine and oxygen. As you can see from Bohr's atomic model of chlorine, it has 17 electrons with an electronic configuration 2, 8, 7. When two chlorine atoms approach each other, each of them is one electron shot from stability. Therefore, they contribute one electron each and mutually share these two electrons. The forces of attraction that hold these chlorine atoms together result in the formation of a chlorine molecule. Note that both the chlorine atoms in a chlorine molecule attain the nearest inert gas configuration of argon. Now let's consider oxygen. The electronic configuration of oxygen is 2, 6. To attain the electronic configuration of neon, that is 2, 8, an atom of oxygen requires two electrons. Hence, two oxygen atoms come together and share two electrons each, making an octet around each oxygen atom. From this, it is inferred that elements combine to become compounds by sharing, losing or gaining electrons. This capacity of elements to combine is known as valency. The number of electrons lost, gained or shared by an atom of an element during a chemical reaction for attaining stable electronic configuration is called valency. In the formation of sodium chloride, the valency of both sodium and chlorine is 1. In the formation of oxygen, the valency of oxygen is 2. What are the images that come to your mind when you hear the word metal? Pen, watch, bicycle, car, 
bus and bridge are all made of metals. On the other hand, helium which makes balloons fly and the carbon that constitutes diamonds are non-metals. What is the basis for distinguishing metals from non-metals? To understand the scientific basis for this classification, you need to examine the physical and chemical properties of metals and non-metals. In this, in this lesson, you will learn about the properties of metals and non-metals. You will also learn how they form compounds and how they can be separated. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to Define metals and non-metals. Locate the position of metals and non-metals in the periodic table. Discuss the physical and chemical properties of metals and non-metals. Compare the properties of metals and non-metals. Metals are elements that have a tendency to lose electrons and form positively charged ions or cations. For example, sodium has an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. During a chemical reaction, sodium can lose an electron to a non-metal like chlorine to form a sodium ion that has an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Conversely, non-metals are elements that have a tendency to accept electrons to form negatively charged ions or anions. For example, chlorine has an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. During a chemical reaction, chlorine can accept an electron from a metal like sodium to form a chloride ion. A chloride ion has an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. To get, to get an idea of the properties of metals and non-metals, let's first locate them in the periodic table. When elements are arranged in the increasing order of their atomic numbers in the periodic table, metals, including alkali and Alkaline earth metals are placed on the extreme left of the periodic table. Non-metals are placed on the extreme right of the periodic table. Based on the positions of metals and non-metals in the periodic table, it is possible to predict their properties. For example, the elements on the extreme left of the periodic table are metals that easily lose electrons and are highly reactive. On the other hand, the elements on the extreme right are non-metals. They readily accept electrons and are also highly reactive. You will now learn about these properties in detail. If, if you look around, you will find metallic objects around you in various forms. For example, jewelry made of gold and silver, wires made of copper, and curtain rods made of aluminium are all metallic objects. Metals are used to make these objects because of some specific physical properties. Let's take a look at some important physical properties of metals. All metals are solids at room temperature, except mercury, which is a liquid. All metals are lustrous. Metal surfaces shine when they are freshly cut. For example, gold and silver are popularly used for making jewelry because of their luster. Metals have high densities and therefore tend to sink in water. For example, tin and lead sink in water. Exceptions to this rule are lithium, sodium and potassium. The density of these elements is lower than that of water and hence they do not sink. Metals are highly malleable and can be beaten into thin sheets. For example, aluminium and zinc can be rolled into thin sheets. This property makes them suitable for use in various industries like construction and manufacturing. Metals are highly ductile and can be drawn into wires. For example, copper and silver can be drawn into thin wires. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity.
Copper wires are commonly used in electrical cables because of this property. Metals have high melting points. For example, tungsten has a high melting point due to which it is used in bulb filaments. Mercury is an exception to this property since it has a low melting point. Iron rusts because it reacts with moisture to form iron oxide which is commonly known as rust. Metals react with other elements in a variety of ways. Let's look at some such reactions. Formation of ionic compounds. Metals lose electrons to non-metals to form strong ionic compounds. For example, sodium loses electrons to chlorine to form sodium chloride, which is an ionic compound. Action of metals with oxygen. Metals burn in the presence of oxygen to form metal oxides, which are basic in nature. For example, a magnesium ribbon burns in oxygen to form magnesium oxide. Action of metal oxides with water. Metal oxides dissolve in water to form basic metal hydroxide solutions. For example, magnesium oxide dissolves in water to form a strong basic solution of magnesium hydroxide. Action as reducing agents. Metals have a tendency to lose electrons. In other words, they are good reducing agents. For example, carbon in the combined form accepts electrons from sodium and gets reduced to carbon in the free state. Thus, sodium acts as a reducing agent. Non-metals non show properties that are unlike metals. That is, they don't possess metallic properties. Let's look at the common properties of non-metals. Non-metals exist as solids, liquids and gases. For example, silicon and carbon are solids. Bromine is a liquid. Chlorine, fluorine and oxygen are gases. Non-metals are non-lustrous. That is, they have a dull appearance. For example, the surfaces of sulfur and phosphorus do not shine. Most non-metals have a very low density. For example, oxygen and nitrogen are lighter than air. The exception is diamond, a form of carbon. Diamond is one of the strongest known substances. This is because carbon in this form has a very high density. Non-metals are non-malleable. For example, sulfur and iodine cannot be hammered into sheets. Non-metals, except for carbon fibers, are not ductile. For example, phosphorus and bromine cannot be drawn into wires. Non-metals are bad conductors of heat and electricity. For example, sulfur and phosphorus cannot conduct electricity. The exception to this property is graphite, which is a good conductor of electricity. Non-metals have low melting and boiling points. For example, sulfur and phosphorus have low melting and boiling points. When, when you make a bonfire, the wood burns to release smoke. The burning of wood involves a chemical reaction called oxidation. The carbon in the wood reacts with atmospheric oxygen to form carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is released in the form of smoke. Let's look at the chemical properties of non-metals in general to understand their behavior with other elements. Formation of covalent compounds. Non-metals form covalent compounds by sharing electrons. For example, in a molecule of hydrogen chloride, hydrogen and chlorine share a pair of electrons. Thus, hydrogen and chlorine are bound together through a covalent bond. Action with oxygen. Non-metals form acidic or neutral oxides. For example, sulfur reacts with oxygen to form sulfur dioxide, which is acidic. Nitrogen combines with oxygen to form nitric oxide. This nitric oxide is neutral in nature. Action of non-metal oxides with water. Acidic oxides dissolve in water to form 
acidic solutions. For example, sulfur dioxide reacts with water to form sulfurous acid. Action of non-metals as oxidizing agents. Non-metals have the tendency to gain electrons. That is, they are good oxidizing agents. For example, chlorine accepts electrons from hydrogen and oxidizes hydrogen sulfide to sulfur. In the process, it liberates hydrogen chloride gas. Thus, chlorine acts as an oxidizing agent. In, in ionic compounds, the forces of attraction between the ions of metals and non-metals are very strong. Therefore, it is difficult to separate the elements in such compounds. You can overcome this force of attraction or decompose this compound by passing electricity through it. The process of decomposition of a substance by passing electricity through it is called electrolysis. To understand how metals and non-metals are separated through electrolysis, let's consider sodium chloride. On passing electricity, sodium chloride splits into sodium and chloride ions. Sodium metal is deposited at the cathode. The non-metal chlorine gas evolves at the anode. Metals and non-metals exhibit a number of differences in their properties. Some of these important differences are Metals are generally solids. But Non-metals may exist in solid, liquid, or gaseous states. Metals have very high melting and boiling points, unlike non-metals. Most metals are malleable, ductile, and lustrous, while non-metals are not. Metals are electropositive, that is, they tend to lose electrons while non-metals are electronegative because of their tendency to accept electrons. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity while non-metals are bad conductors of heat and electricity. Metals form ionic compounds while non-metals form covalent compounds. Metals form basic oxides, while non-metals form acidic or neutral oxides. An ionic bond is formed by the transfer of one or more electrons from a metal to a non-metal. It can also be referred to as the attractive force that binds oppositely charged ions together. Let's see the formation of calcium oxide, which is an ionic compound. An atom of calcium has the electronic configuration of 2, 8, 8, 2. Whereas, an atom of oxygen, which is a non-metal, has the electronic configuration of 2, 6. If the calcium atom loses its valence electrons, its electronic configuration would become 2, 8, 8, which is the electronic configuration of the inert gas argon. On losing two electrons, calcium forms a positively charged ion. On the other hand, if the oxygen atom gains two electrons, 
its electronic configuration would become 2, 8. Thus, it would attain the electronic configuration of the inert gas neon. Therefore, to attain stability, calcium loses two electrons and oxygen gains those two electrons. In this process, oxygen forms the negatively charged ion and calcium forms the positively charged ion. The calcium and oxide ions being oppositely charged are attracted to each other. This leads to the formation of calcium oxide crystal. The formation of ionic compounds can be represented by the methods shown here. Here is the ionic equation of the formation of calcium oxide. The formation of ionic compounds can be explained by using the electron dot structural diagram. Here you can observe that the calcium atom loses two electrons, whereas the oxygen atom gains those two electrons. Thus, both calcium and oxygen get stable noble gas configuration, resulting in the formation of calcium oxide. Another method of representing the formation of ionic compounds is atomic or orbital structural diagram. Here you can observe that calcium has two valence electrons while oxygen has six. By losing two electrons, calcium becomes a dipositive ion which has a stable octet configuration. Oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. It needs another two electrons to get a stable octet configuration. Oxygen gets the two electrons from calcium to get a stable octet configuration and become a divalent anion. The calcium and oxygen ions being oppositely charged are attracted to each other which leads to the formation of a calcium oxide crystal. Another example of an ionic compound is magnesium chloride. An atom of magnesium metal has the electronic configuration of 2, 8, 2. Chlorine, which is a non-metal, has the electron configuration 2, 8, 7. If the magnesium atom loses its valence electrons, its electronic configuration would become 2, 8, which is the electronic configuration of the inert gas neon. On the other hand, if each chlorine atom gains one electron, its electronic configuration would become 2, 8, 8. Thus, it would attain the configuration of the inert gas argon. Therefore, to attain stability, magnesium loses two electrons and the two chlorine atoms gain one electron each from magnesium. In this process, magnesium forms the positively charged ion and chlorine atom forms the negatively charged ion. The magnesium and chloride ions being oppositely charged are attracted to each other. This leads to the formation of magnesium chloride. The formation of ionic compounds can be represented by the methods shown here. Let us see the ionic equation representation of the formation of magnesium chloride. The formation of ionic compounds can be explained by using the electron dot structural diagram. Here you can see that the magnesium atom loses two electrons 
whereas the two chlorine atoms gain those two electrons. One electron for each. In this way, magnesium and the two chlorine atoms get stable noble gas configuration, resulting in the formation of magnesium chloride. Here, you can observe the atomic or orbit structural diagram of the formation of magnesium chloride. By the loss of two electrons, magnesium became a dipositive ion, which has a stable octet configuration. The two chlorine atoms get those two electrons to get a stable octet configuration. Magnesium and chloride ions being oppositely charged are attracted to each other, which leads to the formation of a magnesium chloride crystal. Thus, we can conclude that an ionic compound is formed by the transfer of electrons between two atoms. Carbon compounds are all around us, in our clothes, furniture, food and body. To understand why carbon forms so many compounds, we need to look at bonding in carbon. In this lesson, you will learn about bonding in carbon and the different types of covalent bonds. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to List the properties of covalent compounds. Explain the reasons for each of the properties of covalent compounds. List the steps for writing electron dot structures. Classify the different types of covalent bonds. And explain covalent bonding in carbon with reference to methane. Covalent compounds are identified by some distinguishing properties. Let's look into the properties of covalent compounds. Covalent compounds have low melting and boiling points. This is due to weak forces of attraction between the molecules. For example, chloroform has a boiling point of 60 degrees centigrade. When compared to ionic compounds, Covalent compounds are non-conductors of electricity. This is due to the absence of free ions. The type of bonding in the carbon compounds does not give rise to any ions. To understand the bond formation in carbon, we need to know the combining capacity of carbon. The combining capacity of any element depends on the number of valence electrons. Therefore, in order to know the combining capacity of carbon, we need to know the number of valence electrons in carbon. When we look at the electronic configuration of carbon, it is clear that it has to either gain or lose four electrons to attain noble gas configuration. Suppose carbon gains four electrons, it would form a C-4 ion. But carbon being a competitively less electronegative element than fluorine, chlorine, oxygen, etc. is unable to hold four extra electrons. Meaning, it would be difficult for the six protons to hold the ten electrons. Now, suppose it loses four electrons, it would form a C plus four cation, which is again a difficult task. It would require a great deal of energy to remove four electrons 
leaving the cation with six protons in the nucleus and holding only two electrons. This makes either of these possibilities difficult. Carbon overcomes this difficulty by sharing its electrons with other atoms of carbon or with atoms of other elements. We know that sharing of electrons results in a covalent bond and the shared electrons belong to either of the atoms. This sharing helps in achieving noble gas configuration. The Lewis dot structures provide a picture of the bonding in molecules in terms of the shared pairs of electrons and the octet rule. The Lewis structure is a type of shorthand notation. In this method, atoms are written using their element symbols. Lines are drawn between atoms to indicate chemical bonds. Single lines are single bonds. Double lines are double bonds. Triple lines are triple bonds. Dots and sometimes the symbol X is used to represent an electron. Steps to draw the Lewis structure. Let's take carbon dioxide as an example in writing the Lewis dot structures. The first step in writing an electron dot structure is to locate a central atom. The central atom is the one with the lowest electronegativity. In carbon dioxide, since carbon is less electronegative than oxygen, it is the central atom. After selecting the central atom, connect the other atoms to it with a single bond. We may change these bonds to become double or triple bonds as we progress. So, let us connect the two oxygen atoms with a carbon atom through single bonds on either side of it. The third step is to determine the number of valence electrons possessed by each atom in the molecule. In a carbon dioxide molecule, a carbon atom has four valence electrons and an oxygen atom has six. Now the octet rule states that atoms with eight electrons in their valence shell are stable. Hence, we need to check if the octet is satisfied for each atom or not. The next step is to arrange the electrons so that each atom contributes one electron to a single bond. Now, in the present example, when such an arrangement is done, we can see that there are six electrons around carbon and seven around each oxygen atom. This means that the octet is not complete. As the octet is not complete, move one electron per bond per atom to make another bond. In this example, we observed that the octet was not completed. Hence, we move one electron for each and now we see that both the carbon and oxygen atoms achieve the octet by forming a double bond between them. In a covalent bond, in a covalent bond, a shared electron pair is known as a bond pair. The bond pair is represented by a line between the bonded atoms. Depending on the number of electrons shared between the atoms, the covalent bonds are classified into three types. Single covalent bond, double covalent bond, and triple covalent bond. Let's look at the formation of a single covalent bond, taking the example of a hydrogen molecule. We know that the atomic number of hydrogen is 1. Hence hydrogen has one electron and it requires one more electron to attain the nearest inert gas configuration, which is helium. To achieve this, each hydrogen atom contributes an electron to form a single bond. Thus, a single covalent bond is formed between the two atoms of the hydrogen molecule. Considering the example of oxygen, let's see the formation of a double covalent bond. The atomic number of oxygen is 8 and it requires two electrons to achieve the nearest stable inert gas configuration, which is neon. To achieve this, 
two oxygen atoms contribute two unpaired electrons to produce two bond pairs. Thus, they share these two electron pairs to form a double bond or dicovalent bonds. Let us try it with nitrogen. The atomic number of nitrogen is 7 and it would require three electrons for attaining the nearest inert gas configuration which is neon. Thus the two nitrogen atoms combine together and produce three bond pairs and share the three bond pairs between them. Thus a triple bond is present between the two nitrogen atoms in the nitrogen molecule. Now, now, let us take a heteroatomic molecule like methane and see the covalent bond formation in it. A carbon atom has four valence electrons. During the formation of a methane molecule, one electron of a carbon atom pairs with one electron of a hydrogen atom to form a bond pair. In this way, four bond pairs, which are four CH bonds, are produced. These electron pairs are shared by the carbon and four hydrogen atoms. It is important to remember that carbon is a tetravalent compound and one should always check for the fulfillment of tetravalency. In a covalently bonded molecule, like ethane, even though they have strong bonds within the molecule, the intermolecular forces between them are weak. Because of these weak intermolecular forces, ethane exists as a gas. A covalent bond is formed due to the mutual sharing of electrons between the given pairs of atoms of non-metallic elements. During covalent bond formation, each atom tries to attain octet, that is, eight electrons in its valence shell, or duplet, two electrons in the first shell. Let's study the formation of carbon tetrachloride, which is a covalent compound. One atom of carbon shares its four valence electrons with the four chlorine atoms in carbon tetrachloride. The electronic configuration of carbon is 2, 4. It has four electrons in its valence shell. Hence, it needs four more electrons to attain octet configuration. The electronic configuration of chlorine is 2, 8, 7. Hence, it needs one more electron to get octet configuration. When one carbon atom and four chlorine atoms approach each other, carbon contributes four electrons for sharing while the chlorine atoms contribute one electron each for sharing. One atom of carbon thus shares four electron pairs, one with each of the four atoms of chlorine. In doing so, both the atoms will often achieve the electronic configuration of the nearest noble gas which is particularly stable. Here, you can observe the sharing of electrons between one carbon and four chlorine atoms. Each chlorine atom shares one electron with carbon to get stable noble gas configuration. By this mutual sharing, carbon attains the configuration of the inert gas neon, while the four chlorine atoms attain the configuration of the inert gas argon. Thus, 
four chlorine atoms form four single covalent bonds with carbon. Methane is another example of a covalent compound. The molecular formula of methane is CH4. You already know that carbon needs four electrons to attain a stable octet configuration. Whereas hydrogen needs one electron to get the configuration of helium. In the formation of the methane molecule, one atom of carbon shares four electron pairs, one with each of the four atoms of hydrogen. Here, you can observe the sharing of electrons between one carbon and four hydrogen atoms. Thus, four single covalent bonds are formed between a carbon and four hydrogen atoms. Another example of a covalent compound is water. The molecular formula of water is H2O. Hydrogen needs one electron to attain a stable duplet configuration. On the other hand, oxygen needs two electrons to attain a stable octet configuration. In the formation of the water molecule, each of the two hydrogen atoms shares an electron pair with the oxygen atom, resulting in the formation of two single covalent bonds. Let's now see the formation of one more covalent compound, ammonia. The molecular formula of ammonia is NH3. The electronic configuration of nitrogen is 2, 5. To get the nearest inert gas configuration, nitrogen needs three more electrons. You know that hydrogen has the electronic configuration 1. And so, it needs one more electron to attain a stable duplet configuration. A molecule of NH3 is formed when one atom of nitrogen shares three electron pairs, one with each of the three atoms of hydrogen. Here, you can observe that one atom of nitrogen forms three single covalent bonds with three hydrogen atoms. Nitrogen contains one lone pair of electrons. Thus, we can conclude that a covalent compound can be formed by the mutual sharing of electrons between two non-metals. You already know that an ionic bond is formed by the transfer of valence electrons from one atom to another. Similarly, a covalent bond is formed by the mutual sharing of electrons between pairs of atoms of non-metallic elements. There is one more type of chemical bond called the coordinate covalent bond. A coordinate covalent bond is formed by a shared pair of electrons, with both the electrons coming from the same atom. In other words, one of the combining atoms contributes both the shared electrons. The atom that contributes the two electrons is known as the donor, while the atom or group that accepts the two electrons is known as the acceptor. The coordinate covalent bond is represented by using an arrow. The tail of the arrow indicates the donor and the head, the acceptor of the electron pair in the bond formation. 
Let us study some examples of compounds with coordinate covalent bonds. Look at the hydronium ion. It can be represented as H3O+. You already know that a water molecule is formed by the mutual sharing of electrons between one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms, which results in the formation of two single covalent bonds. Here, you can observe that the oxygen atom contains two lone pairs of electrons after attaining octet configuration. The hydronium ion is formed when a water molecule bonds with a hydrogen ion. A hydrogen ion is formed by the loss of one electron and becomes H+. Thus, it needs two more electrons to get a stable duplet configuration. When a water molecule and a hydrogen ion approach each other, the hydrogen ion accepts the lone pair of electrons from the oxygen atom of the water molecule, which results in the formation of a coordinate covalent bond. Here, you can observe the sharing of the lone pair of electrons of oxygen between the oxygen and the hydrogen ion. Thus, by sharing two electrons from oxygen, the hydrogen ion gets a stable duplet configuration. Now, look at the ammonium ion in which a coordinate covalent bond is formed. The formula of ammonium ion is NH4+. The ammonium ion is formed by the formation of a coordinate covalent bond between ammonia and a hydrogen ion. In ammonia, three hydrogen atoms form three single covalent bonds with nitrogen. Here, you can observe that nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. When ammonia is dissolved in water, it forms an ammonium ion. The hydrogen ion from water accepts the lone pair of electrons of the nitrogen atom of the ammonia molecule, resulting in the formation of a coordinate covalent bond. Thus, the hydrogen ion by sharing a lone pair of electrons of nitrogen gets its stable duplet configuration. Some compounds that have the coordinate covalent bond are the NH3 molecule donates a pair of electrons to BF3 and forms a coordinate covalent bond. In carbon monoxide, a coordinate covalent bond is formed between carbon and oxygen. Thus, we can conclude that a coordinate covalent bond is formed by a shared pair of electrons, with both the electrons coming from the same atom.